thanks everyone uh, for turning up today. Uh, nice to see you all, even if it's virtually. Uh, so this is a genomics Aotearoa seminar, and uh, today we've got uh, a fantastic talk from Matt Littlejohn, who is a professor at Massey University and um, a research leader at Livestock Improvement. So somebody who really sits uh, between both the academic and the applied world, which I think is interesting. Um, uh, Matt was going to be talking about variants modulating the expression of a chromosome domain encompassing plague one influence, oh, encompassing plague one influence bovine stature. So um, I'm really looking forward to that talk. Um, Matt, feel free. Let's go. Thank you very much. And thanks for inviting me to speak today. Um, so the talk title is actually um, high impact mutation in the cattle. <laughs> Um, but it's it's um, similar in scope to to the the plague one story, um, and that we're trying to identify um, mutations that explain phenotypes. Um, and so, what I'm going to do today is talk a little bit about the different approaches that we have historically applied at LIC to try and identify genes and mutations for traits of interest. Um, and then I'll sort of focus in on one story, a more recent story in particular, that's kind of changed our methodology a little bit to that end. Um, so a good place to start proper um, is, is just this one slide about um, who we are at, at Livestock Improvement Corporation uh, for people that um, aren't aware. Um, so LIC is a, a cattle genetics and agritech company. Um, so we're focused on animal improvement. And so essentially we supply uh, farmers with semen um, and we have a big part of the New Zealand dairy market share so four out of five New Zealand dairy cows um, are bred using LIC genetics um, so a lot of people who work at LIC are sort of involved in those um, animal handling or customer facing roles um, but we also have a really big R&D team so at latest count 55 um, people in the R&D team and there's a really diverse um, range of scientists who work in the R&D team. So we have animal breeders, uh, quantitative and molecular geneticists, uh, reproductive biologists, and also an analytics team that sort of applies um, computer science uh, methodologies to some, some of those different areas. Um, and the really cool thing about working at LIC is that we have um, big genomic data sets. Um, and, and we're lucky because uh, from an R&D perspective, um, those big genomic data sets actually are, are driven through commercial breeding activities. So they, so they just happen um, and they're, they're, uh, there's a lot of resource that goes in uh, because they're, they're essentially commercial activities. Um, but we can also use those um, resources to ask research questions. And, and that's what I spend uh, um, a bunch of time in my role doing. Um, so to give you an idea, the, again, the commercially driven um, data sets comprise largely of um, uh, SNP chip information. So we have over a million animals um, SNP chip genotyped. The majority of those are low density chips, but we also have about 250,000 animals genotyped on medium density chips. And we have about 20 phenotypes that are routinely gathered as part of that, those animal breeding activities. Um, and then what we have is our sort of more research focused um, data sets. And these are things like whole genome sequence data, transcriptome data, um, and other sequence um, data sets that we use in conjunction um, with the, the um, commercial um, resources to, to ask research questions. So if I, if I was to categorize the, the types of um, genetic mapping projects at LIC, again, at least historically, and kind of think about the sort of two major approaches um, and that they're defined by the type of trait um, or disease that we're investigating. Um, and, and those are where we're, we're investigating complex traits or, or Mendelian traits. So under the, the complex trait banner, generally we're working with quantitative phenotypes. Um, again, this is opportunistic data. So these are types of traits. So I was just speaking of where, where they're being measured already um, as part of animal breeding activities. And typically we would, uh, like everyone else in the world doing GWAS, we would fit an additive model and analysis of those data. So under the Mendelian banner, um, typically here we're investigating disease, though that's not always the case. Um, and and, and this, uh, in this case, you know, we might be made aware of um, some funny animals. A farmer rings us up and says, there's some funny animals on my farm. And so we would have to go out there and actually prospectively 
gather phenotype and genotype information so the data doesn't already exist um, and then we'd be sort of more tactical in the type of analysis that we would apply based on what we think um, the inheritance model is. So this is a, a slide of just examples of papers we published to that end and so we've done association analysis of body weight um, and then lactation traits um, and on this slide we have um, uh, Manhattan plots and so I thought I'd quickly explain what one of these is I mean, lots of people will have seen these before but I put quite a few of these up in the talk so I'll quickly explain them so those figures on the right hand side of the slide there basically show us the output of a genome-wide association study and so on the x-axis, we've got all of our chromosomes lined up um, from chromosome one through to chromosome 29. So cows have 29 autosomes. And then on the, the y-axis, that's the, the association statistic. And all the dots in those plots uh, represent individual genetic markers that have been tested for association uh, with our phenotype. So what we're looking for there is peaks. Those are the interesting bits. Um, and as you can see, there's lots of peaks. And probably the peakiest uh, GWAS that we've produced is one uh, in the bottom right hand corner there um, by Catherine Tiplady, published last year as part of her PhD, um, looking at um, milk spectral data um, where, where we identify really a lot of, of different QTLs. And if you hear that weird noise, that's my dog whining because my kids have just arrived home from school. Um, in the Mendelian category, Again, these are, um, we uh, do a bit of this, um, and um, an example here would be um, investigation of the Heary syndrome. So, so a number of years ago, um, unbeknownst to us, we had a bull who had a new de novo mutation um, that caused this uh, syndrome characterized by animals being very shaggy, um, and also, um, fortunately for a dairy cow, not making uh, much milk. Um, and so we mapped the, the causal mutation for that um, syndrome, and then, also represented and published the same paper. Um, we um, applied methods to identify the, the slick mutation. So this is a, a variant that's not a disease variant, but rather defines um, the, the a slick coat trait um, that, that gives animals improved heat tolerance and is, is something or characteristic of breeds, um, a handful of breeds that are farmed in the tropics. So those are Mendelian examples. And, and this is another Mendelian example. Um, and uh, this, is, this was a syndrome we were made aware of that we called small calf syndrome. Um, and so feedback from farmers over a number of years, actually, um, there was anecdotal accounts that there was these very small calves turning up and, and that they sort of um, clustered within um, different uh, or certain site, basically mapped to certain sites, so they were from certain site families. And um, so we now um, to these, these farms, identified animals from these sire families and, and got samples, uh, did snip chip genotyping and then did case control analysis um, to identify a haplotype responsible and subsequently um, the cause of mutation, which is the knockout mutation in guarantee two. Um, and so this is where the story changes a little bit. Um, and as I'm sure many people on this call have experienced, when you come to writing up a piece of work, you wonder about what is the best way that I can communicate this um, that the, the reader is going to understand. Um, and so and right at about this time, uh, we had just generated our first um, imputed whole genome sequence data set where we impute sequence resolution data onto SNP chips. Um, and, and so I wondered whether an easier way to tell the story rather than through the, the iterative approach of, of um, you know, we found a haplotype and then did a bunch of sequence analysis and then found a candidate mutation, whether or not we just um, present a GWAS, but we fit a recessive model in that GWAS and, and what does that plot look like? And, and that is what uh, the plot looks like on the slide. You can see there's a, a nice peak up the front end of of chromosome 28, which is the implicated chromosome. And what I've done there is paint up um, the, the candidate causative mutation in red. You can see a red dot right at the top of the peak. So, so all of that looked pretty beautiful. And I, and I think that um, probably is an easier way to tell the story. Um, 
and it looked good enough that I thought, well, maybe we should apply this rather than just in this case, just to our, our um, to all of our animals um, and, and the whole genotype data set. And so that's what uh, these plots represent. And in the top there, we've got um, just a standard additive model and you can see there's two big peaks. And those are the peaks that we expect and, and have, have published on before. And, and lots of people around the world are, um, have published on those peaks. So they're sort of common known um, body weight effects for cattle populations. And then the, the, the kind of surprising bit um, was the plot at the bottom, which is the recessive model, where we see these, um, we see the small calf peak pop up um, as different than what the additive model is giving us. But we also see these entirely new um, big peaks. Um, so this was, again, we were like, what are those things? Um, so I thought just before I go on, just to, def um, to define what it is we're talking about with different inheritance models, um, having shown those, those additive and recessive models on the, on the previous slide. And basically the, the, the decision to, to, to encode genotypes in different ways can, can get at uh, some of the different mechanisms through which um, these mutations act. So basically it's about how we interpret um, genotypes for analysis, so that's why it's important. Um, and then again, the most common case, um, as is applied in, in GWAS all around the world to every different organism, uh, people fit an additive model, um, which is represented by the box plot on the top left there. And that is based on the principle that in a diploid genome like um, uh, cows or humans, um, that we expect um, one copy of the alternative allele will give us half the effect um, and two copies will give us the full effect. Um, but then you've got these other models, um, and there's actually more than three models as we see the way mutations manifest. But these are the sort of three, the three ones that everyone knows about. You have a dominant model where one copy of the alternative allele will, will give you the whole effect. And then you have the, the recessive model where you actually need two alternative copies um, to see the effect. And typically those would be the, the rare or minor alleles as opposed to the major alleles. So in the, the GWAS results are showed in a couple of slides back. Again, that was, that was surprising to us um, that, we could, that there was these new QTLs we hadn't seen before. Um, but really this was me just hacking using um, Plink software, which is kind of the crude way to do it. So it's fast, but it's not the sort of elegant solution. And right at about the time uh, we we made those findings, we had um, a new PhD student starting, Eduardo Reynolds, um, and he, who had some quantitative skills. And so he and um, Doreen Garrick at Massey University um, developed a, a and new approach that specifically tries to, to get at these non-additive effects. So it's a, it's a two-step mixed model approach um, and it, it simultaneously estimates both additive and non-additive effects. And when we applied that to our body weight data and again, the population size um, has, with the passage of time, has gone up a little bit here. So we've got 80,000 cows in this analysis measured for body weight. Um, and we see the same, um, the same new QTL as we did before, and also the, the small calf syndrome peak. Um, and then we also saw a bunch of other new ones. Um, and so what Eduardo has done in this plot is to, to map the um, non-additive effects in blue and contrast those to the additive effects that are in gray. Um, and you can see that, that most of these effects um, actually don't have additive QTL, that you only see them in the recessive model. And so the exception is, is the, the one prominent peak there on chromosome 14 that doesn't have a little red arrow next to it. Um, and that, that is one of those um, the commonly um, well, well known uh, major effect additive QTL I was talking about previously um, that actually is, is mostly an additive QTL but has a little bit of non-additivity in it in that. If you, if you were to map the genotype classes, the heterozygote is a little bit closer to one of the homozygotes as opposed um, to a, a, a recessive or dominance effect. And so that's the only one of those we have um, in, in this plot. And all, the, all of the peaks that have red arrows next to them um, show up as pure recessive effects. And so one way you can sort of visualize whether or not um, you have a recessive or, or a partially um, non-additive effect um, is you can plot 
the, the p-values against each other in a scatter plot, which is what's shown at the bottom of this slide. And again, you can see the mostly additive effect on chromosome 14 for the PAG1 gene, where nearly all of the associated markers um, are, or the, the strength of association happens along the x-axis there, um, where there are, there's a handful of markers that are just, just um, significant for non-additive effects. And then the other category of effects we see are, are these, again, recessive QTL um, on the left-hand side there where, where nearly all the markers, so the markers are highly significant only in the non-additive model and there's none that, are, that show really any additivity. So one of the, the um, kind of shocking things about um, these new recessive QTL um, is that they showed massive effects. So what we've re represented here on the left-hand side is, is taking the tag variants, so variants from each of the, the associated loci, both the, the non-additive and additive models, um, additive being blue and non-additive being red, and then plotted them by effect size and minor allele frequency. Um, and so the, the additive ones are, are the, the basically taking all tag snips from, from all significant loci in the gray um, uh, Manhattan plot from the previous slide. And you can see that those ones generally have small effects and represent a range of allele frequencies. And the non-additive ones represent very la much larger effects um, and tend to be very rare. Um, so that's in body weight. And what you can see is that they also have major effects across lots of other traits too. Um, so that's what this heat map shows on the right-hand side. Um, so here we've got basically most of the animal breeding traits um, for which we have data um, in the rows. And then we have the individual loci in the, in the columns. So the recessive loci in particular in the columns. And you can see that each, each one of those chromosome um, numbers, um, there, is, there is two columns and one column represents the heterozygote effect and one column represents the homozygote effect. And what can, you can see across the first six columns there is that all of the color is in the homozygote effect, which is basically to say that they're purely recessive impacts. Um, and, and so you can see again that they have, um, there's the, the intensity of color is the effect size. And so they, they affect lots of traits uh, and, and, uh, in a big way. Um, the other thing that's pretty cool is, and represented on this, um, in this image is that the far right of that figure, we've got two of the, the very well known um, uh, major QTL for um, that that have been published on for many years um, in, in cattle and, and these are actually additive effects and you can see that because this is color in both columns heterozygote and homozygote columns and as an example that DGAT1 uh, column anybody who's worked in cattle will have heard of this QTL it's um, it was discovered I think nearly 20 years ago um, that's when the mutation was described and is, is widely known as, as basically the big whopper QTL that you get when you, when you do association analysis with milk traits. Um, and what you can see is that these new QTL um, have bigger effects than that. So another interesting thing about these new recessive QTL um, is that if we look at the tops of the peaks, um, so there's a lot going on in the slide, but basically what we're doing here is we're zooming in at, to megabase resolution, so zooming right in on the peaks from, from the, the whole genome Manhattan plot, and then looking at what um, candidate functions, uh, predicted functions of candidate variants within those peaks uh, might have. And, and what struck us when we looked at these is that um, unlike a lot of other GWAS results, uh, sequence-based GWAS results that we have looked at, and, and for example, in lactation traits and, and fitting additive models, is that the tops of the peaks, there were obvious candidate protein coding variant um, as, either at the, as the top associated variant or very near to it. Um, and so, so we wondered, is this, um, does this happen by chance or is, are these recessive QTL really highly enriched for, for major um, protein disrupting effects? And so to try and ask this question, um, Basically, we took the top variant um, for each of these QTL, irrespective of what the, the functional prediction was, um, and, and all variants that were in strong linkage disequilibrium with that. So these would be 
the, the, uh, on the statistical basis alone, the candidates as to potentially underlying um, these QTL. And then compared the proportion of missense and nonsense variants within those, that cluster of variants um, to those just randomly selected from the genome via, via permutation. So basically setting a baseline of what is, the, what is your average um, missense and nonsense um, proportion. And the punchline's at the bottom of the slide there, but basically we see really strong enrichment for these missense and nonsense variant classes. Um, and, and we actually did this with the additive QTL as well, and we do see enrichment uh, for those classes in the additive QTL, but it's, it's about twofold as opposed to fivefold. So it seems like the recessive QTL um, appear to, to be more so enriched for these um, uh, protein disrupting variants. The other thing we noted about um, these QTL or, or the, the, what we think are the causative mutations for these QTL is that there were fewer homozygotes than there should have been in the, in the greater population. Um, and so that's what's represented and, and tested here in this table where we have um, the, the first column is basically all of the, the impacted genes. So the different um, six different QTL of interest um, the, the next column is um, the breed in which they originate. So we do this analysis in, in pure breeds because we want to minimize any sort of stratification. And then the next column is the counts um, based on those pure breed animals um, that we see of the major allele homozygote, heterozygote, and minor allele homozygotes. So that latter class, which is in, in yellow there, is, is, are the affected class, basically. And so if we look at that top line for the PLCD4 gene, we see that, um, that um, based on the allele frequency um, that we calculate from those counts, um, there's actually only half uh, the number of homozygotes that we would expect. And so this is using the, the Hardy-Weinberg equation. So we expect 54 and we see 26. Um, and so what we think is happening is that um, either there is some, so, so not all of the variants are significant, but but most of them are, are trending towards depleted. And what we think is happening is that um, either there's some in utero um, effect that is um, the, the fetus or embryo is being lost during development so that the animals never get born and therefore never get genotyped. Um, or alternatively, they're actively being selected against by the farmer. So, so they are born, but the farmer doesn't like them and, and the animals get culled. And so, so that, in conjunction with the major effect sizes, led us to assume that, that um, at least some of these new variants actually represent new disease variants um, and for diseases that we didn't actually know about. So, so with that in mind, uh, we wanted to actually look at some animals um, and, and I should point out that all of the analysis that I've showed so far is based on uh, pre-existing data, so, so genotype and phenotype data that we already had, we hadn't actually looked at any animals. Um, so here we went out um, to farms to try and identify um, calves that might be homozygous. And the way that we did that um, was to look for, so using the national database um, that records matings um, for New Zealand dairy cows, we looked for, for newly born calves that had um, a heterozygous sire uh, for one of the three um, variants of large defect, and also a heterozygous maternal grandsire. Um, and the reason why we tar targeted um, or honed in on the sires is that those are the animals that we have um, lots of genotypes for. So we have pretty much all the genotypes for all the sires um, and less so for dams. Um, but based on that um, the, and the probabilities that those different sires would transmit um, the disease alleles, um, we would expect to get about one in eight of uh, animals sampled as homozygous. Um, so we went to, to about 50 farms um, and, and sampled 600 candidates and saw um, a bit less than um, one in eight, um, but certainly um, sampled a whole bunch of affecteds. And we bought um, nine of each of those, including some controls and then we grazed those at um, Ag Research uh, Ruakura, which is a research farm, to um, look at them more closely. So the animal trial itself um, was led by Catherine Lee um, at, um, at 
IC and did, she did a huge amount of work and measured really a lot of things um, that I can't represent um, everything. So I'm just going to show you the, the, the really interesting bits, which is um, the, one of the, this mutation here, which is um, PLCD4 mutation. Um, and here's photos of um, mutants and controls um, being grazed together on the same farm. Um, similar pedigree, so similar ancestry, uh, other than their, their mutation status. And you see that the mutants are, are scrawny looking um, compared to the, the controls um, and, and actually are about, I think at two years old, are about 100 kilograms lighter um, than controls. And, and you can also see in this table uh, a bunch of other anatomical measures um, are also different. Um, and then that fits with the, the GWAS data where we see a whole host of different um, impacts for, as a consequence of the mutation. Um, another interesting one that we investigated is this FGD4 um, mutation. So this is a, a nonsense mutation, a central splice site uh, variant that, that in, we used RNA-seq data um, to show that yes, indeed, um, the gene isn't um, correctly spliced. So we expect this to be a knockout. And in this case, unlike the, the previous case, actually, whereas you look at the function of PLCD4 and there's, there's no strong implication really at all into areas of biology where you might think, well, there could be a, some body weight consequence. In, in this case, um, we knew what this gene did from human studies, uh, where it's, it's, it's well known that in, um, in human patients with null mutations in FGD4, um, they have Charcot-Marie Tooth Syndrome, um, which is a, a peripheral neurological disorder. Um, and so essentially we knew what to look for in these animals. Um, and so we did indeed um, see um, some sort of stumbling of, of some of these animals and also when they were yarded um, and, and put into the, uh, the head bale, um, some of the, the affected would sort of collapse um, and, and seem to have some sort of um, neurological deficits, um, but it was something that we, we actually struggled in quantitative terms to, to measure and put a p-value on. So what, what we ended up doing is um, euthanizing some of the animals and controls to look at what is best known about um, one of the key phenotypes of Charcot-Marie Tooth disease, which is um, the, the nerve pathology associated with that um, disorder. And here in Dittmer at Massey University, who's a vet pathologist, um, led this work. Um, and, and what this slide, all these images show, um, are cross sections, so electron microscopy images of cross sections of nerves from uh, the affecteds on the left hand side and the controls on the, oh, sorry, the other way around, the controls on the left hand side and the affecteds on, on the right hand side. Um, those sort of black um, circles that you can see, that's the, the myelin. Um, and you can see in the control animals that there's a sort of a, a thick layer of myelin and in the, the mutant animals, um, there's a thin layer of myelin and then other images so show sort of chaotic, disorganized um, bundles, nerve bundles and, and where the myelin is, is, um, is degenerated. So this is basically what you see um, in human cases. Um, these images are what we put into the Reynolds paper, but Kieran has actually published another paper in the last month um, that does a sort of a more thorough um, characterization of the nerves of these animals. So if you want to look at some more beautiful pictures, um, you can look at um, Kieran's paper. But essentially what this showed us was um, that these animals um, almost certainly did indeed have the, the bovine form of Charcot-Marie tooth. So if we just reflect on those results a bit, um, I think what, what we, we have identified at least for a subset um, of the, those QTL were new disease alleles. And, the, and these were um, discovered from, um, from routinely gathered body weight data. We didn't have to, uh, pharma didn't have to tell us about this disease, which again is, is how we would normally sort of get into one of these investigations. This was essentially a hypothesis free approach. Um, but one question is, well, why, why is body weight giving us uh, these, um, these signals. Um, and so our, our hypothesis there is that essentially the body weight's acting as a, as a catch-all um, and proxy for sort of animal health status or disease. Um, and it's interesting because if we look at the small calf syndrome case, 
Um, there's, there is actually a, a parallel human syndrome for null mutations in GALN-T2 called GALN-T2 um, CDG, congenital disorder of glycosylation. Um, and it's not defined by body weight effects at all. The primary and, and all of the early papers are based around characterization of, of some of the, the other intellectual, intellectual disability effects. Uh, and, and only recently has, has any indication that, that uh, patients are smaller sort of being made. Um, so, so really body weight is a secondary effect, but it allows us to identify um, sort of um, a, a more complex phenotype. Um, and then the same is true of the Charcot-Marie II syndrome. Again, it's a best described um, that for the, as a neurological disorder and the disability that, that um, comes with that. Um, but also um, there is a, a muscle atrophy aspect to it, and we, we think that that's basically what body weight gives us a signature of. Um, so that's the, that's the theory why this works. Um, but a, a key question then is, um, given that we have lots of other traits, um, and some of these traits we've actually measured in greater numbers of animals, such as uh, lactation traits, um, is will this work when we apply it to others? And the answer there is yes, it does. So this is a, a more recent analysis and more recent paper than what I've previously been presenting on, um, where um, Eduardo again um, led this analysis, uh, GWAS um, analysis of milk fat yield amongst other lactation traits. And again, the data set size has gone up. So we've got 124,000 cows in this analysis. What you can see is that there's lots of blue, blue peaks. Um, and, but actually a lot of those blue peaks are the same as the body weight peaks, that is the, those other recessive syndromes. Um, and so I haven't pointed little red arrows to those ones, but there's new ones as well. And that's what the, the red arrows point to. Um, as an example of one of those new loci um, is shown here, in the, well, the, the um, zoomed in Manhattan plot on the bottom right of the slide, um, the, the top sitting right at the top of that peak um, which is actually not significant in this GWAS, but is the most highly associated variant on this chromosome. Um, also actually in a, in a later, later analysis um, with more animals, we've now shown that it is quite highly significant. Um, that very top variant is actually a, a um, conserved missense mutation in this gene, SLC25A4. Um, and in, in humans, when we find null mutations in SLC25A4 and, and also uh, de novo dominant mutations in, in that same gene um, cause a, a mitochondrial disorder um, and, and myopathy and a whole host of other negative impacts. So, so um, we haven't looked at these animals at all, um, but what I suspect is, again, that we're picking up on um, a, a syndrome that has a sort of parallel to... to uh, human disease. So here's another um, uh, lactation trait from that same paper. And, and this one perplexed us a little bit. Um, this is milk fat percentage as opposed to the yield of fat um, that you get in milk. And, and I was really excited about um, this GWAS. Um, as I said to, to Eduardo at the time, we're going to be going to discover heaps of new recessive QTL because this trait is one of my favorite traits um, over the years because you just map so many QTLs, um, in, at least in the additive model. Um, and as you can see, as reflected in, in the gray there, there's massive numbers of genetic signals. So we're expecting to see heaps of recessive QTLs and actually we saw none. Um, and so you can see blue peaks in this, this view here, but those are, those are of the category that I described earlier, which is basically additive effects where there's some slight um, imperfect additivity to them, so they show up in the non-additive model. There's no major effect recessive variants. Um, so this perturbed us a bit, and, and it still perturbs me a little bit. Um, but the way I sort of justify this is that maybe um, there's some traits that actually are quite poor proxies of animal health. And, um, in the previous example, so looking at um, milk fat yield, um, where it's, there's actually a, a, a real sort of energetic cost in lactation to producing large amounts of fat, um, 
and because that that energy has to come from somewhere but that could be a better um, of energy status or, or animal health than something like the uh, milk composition where the, the amounts of different things in milk are, are freer to to vary um, with with lower energy cost but again that's that's just kind of a hypothesis and it shows that this approach doesn't work for all traits. So that's kind of a, a rundown on the on the science of those discoveries and and so the question is how are we trying to use these? Um, we're an animal breeding company so we want to actually um, we want to benefit farmers through these discoveries and so so there's a few things that we're doing to try and um, implement um, the, the tests for the, for the variants. Um, over those two papers that I've just described, or the results that, it, um, that appear in those two papers, there's a total of 11 new recessive variants discovered. Um, they range from uh, really big effects, like I showed, and then lots of sort of little effects, at least through the traits that we measure um, for, for animal breeding. Um, they don't seem to do well, they don't seem to do enough that you would want to select or, or reject an animal on that basis. Um, so at least for those, those big effects, those are sort of priority for, for um, selection. And, and what we're doing is avoiding where we can um, purchasing carrier bulls for the big ones. And I say where we can because we've discovered so many of these now, and that's on a baseline of knowing about handfuls of these types of um, mutations previously either discovered by us or other groups around the world that now um, if we if we look at that full catalog of variants it's actually quite hard to find or certainly um, less than 50 percent of sires that we have um, will be a carrier for nothing um, so so it becomes very difficult to take a hard and fast approach where we say we won't breed any bulls that, that carry any variant because there's basically no bulls left to choose from um, so, we, so we're trying to focus on the, the big effect ones. Um, and then the other big thing we're doing is we've included these variants on our uh, parentage testing chips. So these are, this is a commercial product um, that farmers use to screen their, their mostly new calves. It's mostly calves, but some uh, older animals as well. And uh, to basically figure out um, with, you know, which, which animal side um, uh, their, their progeny. And we have these variants on those chips. Um, so, so if a farmer submits um, a bunch of samples and we identify that they have one or more of these uh, major effect mutations, um, then we can advise them of that and, and then they can make a decision as to whether they, they keep the animal or what they do um, with that animal. Um, and just as an aside, um, again, we've these have been on chips for a while now, a couple of years, and in that time, we've now genotyped over eight hundred thousand animals um, for these variants. As you can see a, a cluster, Illumina cluster plot for in the bottom left of the slide that shows the um, genotyping data for this FGD four Shakamiri tooth mutation. Um, there's actually only 50,000 animals in that plot because um, the software crashes if you try and load much more than that. Um, but again, we, we've screened um, over 800,000 animals and identified about five, 590 effectors to date. So in terms of future work, um, the, I think based on the analysis that we've already done, we've already found the sort of moderate allele frequency uh, variants. So so I probably don't think I put that up in the talk in, um, anywhere, but basically the allele frequency of a lot of the ones that we're finding minor allele frequency is about three to 5% um, within pure breeds. Um, and so, so we think there's plenty more discovery to be made, but essentially it will be at, at lower and lower allele frequencies. Um, and at the, those lower allele frequencies, it gets harder and harder because you need bigger population sizes. And also we're working largely with imputed data and imputing very low allele frequency markers is quite difficult. So to enable new discovery, what we're doing is, is trying to physically genotype things where we can. And so we've taken our whole genome sequence resources and, and identified high impact alleles, so nonsense variants, missense variants, and then got those on our chips. Um, and so the two chips that we're using, mostly uh, a, um, a custom 50K chip 
um, and we're doing about 50,000 animals a year, and that has um, both missense and nonsense targets. Um, so thousands of those and, and focusing um, again at sort of lower allele frequencies, um, mainly because we know that's not very good at, at imputing. Um, and then on the, the parentage chips, um, here we, we, there's fewer numbers of things that can be targeted. And so we just go after the highest impact classes, which is basically gene knockouts and, and also focusing again on those very low allele frequency things that we're um, unlikely to be able to impute. So in summary, um, that through these methods, uh, we found that we could directly map new syndromes using proxy traits, and that's in the absence of, of knowing about the disease. Again, that's, a, that's different than how we used to, to discover or work with disease. Um, that these effects um, are, have impacts on many, many different traits, so the pleiotropic effects, ranging from sort of mild effects to quite spectacularly large effects. Um, and, and farmers are um, already benefiting uh, through this work, through, through changes in how we select bulls and also the ability to screen large numbers of calves. And hopefully, um, based on these new data sets that we're building, um, that there are many, many more discoveries to come. So just for acknowledgement, some, some uh, shout outs here, special mentions that I, that I have to make. So Eduardo, um, again, as a PhD student who has now completed, who, who led a lot of the work, um, Catherine Neely, who, who ran and, and led the animal trial experiments, uh, Thomas Lopdell, who, who's done a lot of the bioinformatics on individual, some of these individual mutations, um, Steve Davis and Chad Harland, who were involved in the small calf syndrome discoveries, um, and Chad particularly in some of the, the sort of panel development and, and commercialization work. Um, and Yu Wang, who is our genomics Aotearoa uh, connection. Um, so Yu was um, a sponsored postdoc, or Yu is a, a postdoc currently with LIC, but her previous postdoc um, was uh, sponsored by GA and, and Yu generated by imputation some of the data sets um, that have contributed to these discoveries. Um, and then in terms of funders, um, a special mention to MB Endeavor, um, who, who fund a, a uh, a large grant that has enabled a bunch of this work. Just finally, finally, um, just to let you know, if you like the sound of, of what we're doing and this all sounds exciting, then, then you should come and work with us. So we have um, MSc and PhD student projects supervised through Massey, so you can, you can um, emerge with a, a Massey qualification and get to to work with LIC data. Um, so if you're interested in that, um, send me an email. And then the other thing to say is we're actively um, advertising at the moment for a research assistant in bioinformatics. So this is a person who'd be in, involved in some of the sequence informatics and, and running the pipelines that again, generate the, the data sets that I've described today. Thank you. Any questions? That was awesome. You must remember, you've got to imagine the thunderous applause of people in their offices around the country uh, clapping. It's always uh, a bit anticlimactic. But um, that, that was a really interesting uh, exposition of, of some, some very cool technology.